It's academic and it's theater, the place where they both meet. You have to be audience and participant for each other. Intellectual practices, historical practices, cultural practices. Everybody, please. Examples of women sharing what it is that you do, sharing how you do that. There's no way you can ignore Latinos anymore. Work from all around the world. You can come and see and talk about. What time is it now uh, in Kenya? It started out about different people and about different things. A whole sea of phenomena. Theater for everybody, yes, everybody. That's just what should be done. And indeed, my understanding of life, relationships, death, has already changed. So, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the very first event of the 2016 Prelude Festival. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Tom Seller and this is, is Anke Ergen. <laughs> we are the co-curators of the 2016 uh, edition uh, of this year's festival and we will also be co-moderating uh, this afternoon's conversation. Our title for the themed portion of this year's festival is Welcome Failure. Uh, and it's an attempt to ask what spaces for failure uh, exist in New York City theater, dance, and performance today, what uh, spaces for failure could exist, uh, and what values our artists use to understand failure. So our conversation today uh, is with uh, three artists and centers uh, around the practice side of that question. Uh, and uh, our conversation will be streaming live on howlround.org. And there will also be time for you all to ask uh, questions and join the discussion at the end of this uh, hour plus. Uh, our three guests today are here not because they uh, somehow embody failure, uh, which was something that we uh, learned about in making the invitations this year. Uh, <laughs> uh, but actually just the opposite, it's a very tricky uh, uh, thing. Um, quite the opposite because they've actually sustained experimental practices uh, over time uh, in a very challenging environment and have become very important creative forces in our New York City uh, performance community. So uh, because of their commitment to experimentation, that's exactly why we wanted to ask them about failure today. Now over to Antje to introduce our panel. Yeah, well, this is also the first of five conversations that, were, uh, that will take place over the course of the next three days. Um, yeah, it is really our great pleasure to kick off the festival with Sybil Kenson, Brian Rogers, and John Collins. Um, and as Tom said, exactly. So when we were thinking about the, the topic of um, the festival failure, this was really the first idea for a panel that came to mind because we are very curious what does it mean to incorporate failure in artistic practice, question mark. How important is it and what does it mean to um, artists that are making successfully theater and performance in New York City today? Um, and that's basically our first question to you. So what is artistic failure? What does it mean to you? <laughs> I would say, to, um, maybe this is a kind of a provocation, but I think there's been a degree to which it's true for me, um, both in my own work and in the work that I do as a curator. I think there's nothing that isn't a failure. I mean, I, I, I mean especially, I think from my own work, I never consider it to be successful, which is not, um, <coughs> which is mainly to say that I, um, I'm just always conscious of what I could do differently and better in sort of every aspect of everything that I do. And to me, that's interesting. I don't think of that really as negative, but um, I feel like thinking of, like, I guess in some ways the word success is not that productive or useful in some ways. 
I feel that um, in going into uh, a, any practice of art making, that it's especially in our culture, in this country, that you are setting yourself up for failure from the get-go. And I feel like the whole, um, if you're doing your job, then the entire process is steeped in failure, is directed toward failure, um, and originates from some kind of failure. And I don't think that that's always been true or, or, um, or that there aren't um, some, like I think of ancient Greek art or something like classicism where everything was about perfection and the perfection of the human form and the perfection of the universe. And, um, but I feel we are in a different place than that now and that, um, there's there's really no other choice. If you're if you're going to go into it, then you are you are stepping into failure all of the time, and that you never have it figured out. There's never a point where you're sitting back and putting your feet up and saying, "I got it. I've mastered it, and I've achieved mastery." And like, you know, this is it. Th that it's a it's it's a constant um, shedding of. Uh, ideas of, of what is good and what is bad and what is right and what is wrong and what is success and what is failure, that that is, it's a, it's a constant state of flux and shift. And, and that, is, that is the practice um, and that it never, it never strays from that, um, from that. Well, I think that whenever that you, you hear that idea put forward about, about failure, there's something, and the reason why people sometimes giggle when they hear of a, a title of a panel like this, you know, is because they think of the failure immediately means, oh, you, that a lack of success, <laughs> or that failure means you didn't, uh, you lost, you know, nobody thinks you're any good. Um, <laughs> But I got a very different idea about failure in relationship to my work um, through what uh, Sarah Jane Bales wrote in her book, um, which was called Performance Theater and the Poetics of Failure. And uh, that, wh the way she looked at it and the way I kind of came to understand it and relate to it was that failure was more to do with like, uh, had more to do with intention and with did the thing you intended to happen, happen? And, and, in, and in the work that we do in, in, in live theater, the thing that I fell in love with early on about live theater was that the thing that you intended to happen almost never happened. I mean, that's, and that's why you love it, you know, because you're, you get up on stage every night and, and try to do the exact same show again, and you have to fail to do the same thing because it's live, because it's real. And then, you know, then I started to understand that as a really beautiful thing. And in our early work, we even staged fake failures. You know, in the uh, we would we would we would want the audience to think something had gone wrong, just because that was a, always a thrilling thing to experience in the audience. You know, then you're really there. It's really happening. It's really live. So, failure to me has always been yeah a starting point. And and I completely relate to what you said, Sybil, about you know that you never master it, and that you're always working at it. So in a way, it's about always setting your goal a little farther than you can actually reach, and that's what keeps you moving. It sounds a little depressing, though. I mean, you're it's saying there's very always depressing. <laughs> we're, there's always this gap between the idea and its realization, and you're never hitting the mark. And every night you're oh, but going that's, out. That's not depressing at all to me. That's really exciting. I mean, that's if it weren't for that, we may as well, you know, work in a different medium. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of us who work in, in live theater, mm -hmm. you know, because if it's, you know, if it's if it's perfect every time, then, then you're not likely to have a unique experience watching it. So, but if you understand that to be true and to be a defining aspect of the form that you're working in, how do you deal with um, external expectations, the, the expectations that are attached to projects uh, around, uh, around your work? I mean, I'm sure you've all um, faced uh, that in some sense the marketing machine gets started early uh, around 
your work. Uh, there are reviews, uh, there are pressures that come from uh, grants uh, and um, from peer expectations and from the expectations of the institution, maybe the presenting or the producing institution. How do you reconcile um, your understanding as an artist of that inevitable failure with <laughs> those external uh, expectations? I think it's important to um, be able to have different hats. Like, I'm now I'm going to drive the bus, so I'm putting my bus driver hat on. I'm driving the bus, and then I pull over, and then I'm going to get off and put on a different hat to do a different job. And so I think it's important to keep those uh, as separate as possible. And I do feel that there's a lot of room for creativity uh, in grant writing and in marketing, and that that's part of uh, our our responsibility is to keep questioning those structures and those institutional machines all the time. Um, but it's it's it's. Um, I think the for me the only recourse is that when I'm going in and and doing what I need to do in terms of writing or making something that I have to completely ignore all of that stuff. And especially because I'm not deciding ahead of time what the thing that I'm making is going to be. I, I'm, I'm going into a process, so I won't know until way later, sometimes after the project is long over, what it is going to be. And so all of those attempts have to be, um, have to receive a certain amount of failure and sustain a certain amount of failure also. Um, for me, I think, it's really a kind of a gnarly thing for me because I largely, as an artist, function inside an organization that I co-founded and still run. So those things all kind of collapse together. So when there's institutional pressure on, on me in terms of my work in certain ways, that pressure is coming from myself, wearing a different hat. And, um, <clears throat> and so the way that that's sort of fallen down for me over the course of you know, 10 plus years is that in a, in a sort of, it's both interesting and terrible, but those, um, I've gotten to this place where I don't really think of any of these things as separate activities anymore. So going into the room and making a piece and writing a grant or planning, planning a fundraising dinner or um, thinking about the payroll are all kind of similar practices for me now. They're all the same thing. So it's all, in a weird sort of way, just about showing up. Um, and that, to me, is the way in which I, um, I think, worry less about um, things like marketing and reviews and, th and that kind of thing. I mean, part of it is also because I work on a quite small, I mean, I've, I've chosen to construct a scale around my work that's very, very manageable. And so the, Im the potential negative impact of, of certain things like bad reviews or that, that um, <clears throat> I think it's quite different for me than it might be um, for say ERS, depending on wh where the work is happening and who's, who's maybe reading a review and making a decision to buy a ticket or not buy a ticket based on the content of that review. That doesn't really happen so much at the chocolate factory. It's gonna be, it's more or less gonna be sold out regardless of what the reviews have to say because we're only selling a certain, I mean, it's, and that's, that, that is because, you know, the, the size of the house is, is small and um, <clears throat> the people that are coming are interested for other reasons. They're more, they tend to be more intensely interested in the thing that we're doing. They're not necessarily passive or casual, you know, cultural, shoppers um, but there are um, but there are lots and lots of challenges I think around the systems that we all have to interact with in terms of writing grants and deciding how we're going to talk about something that, that we're going to make before we've made it but I, I, think, that I think there are ways to flip that into <clears throat> into a place where it's actually um, a u useful I think to, go to your point like there's I've, I've started to see writing grant applications from my work to be a really interesting um, exercise of, I guess, you know, interrogating the thing that I think I'm going to do, knowing full well that what I ultimately will do will probably bear very little resemblance to the thing that I say. It's still, in, it's still interesting. Um, I think for experimental artists or avant-garde artists or anybody who's doing anything that is trying to be new in some way, it's, it's useful to distinguish between two different kinds of failure that I think we're already risking conflating. And one is what we started talking about, which is there's sort of process failure, you know, which is how we look at the way we make things and, and the, a certain kind of excitement and, and, and 
you know, imaginative potential of things going wrong, of things not going the way you intended them to, and, and, dis and therefore discovering something. And so when I think about failure on that side of this line, uh, of the process side, you know, it's always an exciting, you know, it's, it's, a, it's not just a thing to tolerate, it's something to strive for, you know, is to always make sure I'm open to things going differently <clears throat> than what I had imagined or intended. But then there's, on the other side of that line, is a different failure, which is, I think, what this question is a little bit more about, which is, um, which is really the failure that's connected to risk. It's the thing you, you are risking <coughs> when you do something risky. And, and that means, and that is more about people's expectations, but it's about the thing you make when it gets out of your hands. You know, is it, you know, and I think that, again, doing something, you know, I'm always thinking about people's expectations and how to uh, work through them or over them or around them and surprise an audience with something they were not expecting. And that comes with a risk built in that in that other way it is going to fail. They're not gonna like it, you know? And there are, there are a whole bunch of measures of this, you know, and then they're sort of on a spectrum, you know? There's, will we get the grant? You know, will we, uh, will, will we get a good review? Will we get invited to tour the show somewhere? Um, or just, you know, all the way down to, is each individual person gonna have a good experience? And, you know, you can, and, and there's always going to be some success there and some failure, but I think that's, that kind of failure is, is very real and is the really negative kind, because that's, you know, when we do something experimental or, you know, risky in some way, we still want it to work but we know it won't always. So that's, that's something that just, I guess, comes with the territory. Yeah, well, so that's right. And I mean, all three of you have been doing work for a long time now. So you have built, created a voice. So people, that plays again in the expectation um, question, but um, has failure compared to when you started? So are th the stakes are higher now. So um, is it, easier actually to deal with failure or is it you know because people also know you maybe they trust you like well maybe that piece you know was not that people's cup of tea but they come back because they love your work and so is it easier now or harder to deal with that I don't I don't feel any different about it weirdly um, I guess there's more I do feel more pressure um, but I think it's the same, I think it's the same problem, if that is a problem, mm -hmm. that from beginning, from beginning to end. Um, while the, the problems with, within, um, within the work itself change all the time, those, those problems of worrying about getting support for your work, which is, I guess is what we're talking about, right? It's like support, uh, external support for your work that never changes, that worry, if, it's, if you're going to accept it as a worry or a concern, is always going to be there, I think, no matter what. And it's, uh, it's it, we have no control over that, really. I can't, I can't manage what people are going to think of what I'm doing at all. And if, and if I think that I can, then I'm in big trouble. Or if I think that I should try, Right to do that to like make sure of and of how people are going to receive anything, um, but I think those pressures are always there from before you start making work until after you're not making work anymore. Yeah, I think I mean it's it, what I'm. It, it's this is a total cliche, but I think that for me, um, I think you know you know when I came when I started doing when I started to. When I decided that I was going to try to like have this certain kind of life when I was in my 20s, I think there was, I think I did have maybe this sort of um, ridiculous fantasy that at a certain point it would become less difficult and it has, it, it definitely hasn't become <laughs> less difficult, it's become more interesting and I feel like I just, it's, it's like, it's not about, it's not about like overcoming failure, it's just about failing differently or failing larger or failing better and those are all things that I think um, I've just, come to accept more as I get older, so, that, so but it does, I don't think that it's, nothing, literally nothing has changed except that I, um, you know, now I, now I do this for a living and then, you know, uh, and so, and, 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 and I have to sort of 
every day um, reinvest in the, in the process of trying to be able to continue to do this for a living, and that just never, ever, ever stops. Um, but I do think one of the things that I would that I think has become has been coming into my head a lot more lately, and it's not and it has to do with my own work, but it also has to do with the work that I present in my venue. Is that I think there's there's actually a really interesting danger of failing at failing, that um, in the sense that you know I think that there's this been the kind of um, you know, the, 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 all of the words that we use around experimentation and um, I think all the words we use around um, supporting the creation of work, I think there's, all, you know, there's lots of sort of cliched phrases like, you know, room to fail, freedom to fail, um, that I think have actually kind of been co-opted in an institutional sense. Um, and it's actually now possible, and this kind of relates to what each of you was saying in, or a, a minute ago, that it's actually quite possible to um, fail in a way that's expected. <laughs> yeah, if that makes any yeah. sense. So can, can you maybe give an example of that, what that might look like or mean? And also, um, you mentioned um, trying to fail bigger or fail harder. Um, which I think was uh, where the title for this conversation came from, Samuel Beckett's famous declaration that the artist's job is to fail big and hard and nobly. Um, can you give, give us an example of maybe something you did in your practice to fail harder or bigger, or also an example of what it means to fail in a safe way or an expected known way? It could be from your own practice or something you witnessed anonymously. I do, I keep thinking of this exercise I do with my students where, um, and, and I teach performance writing, and so I'll say, oh, the first day I make everybody say what is the greatest play in the world, or what is your favorite play, and you can only pick one, and then there's a bunch of other super annoying questions that Mac Wellman did to us at um, Brooklyn College when, when I was there, and so, um, I make them say what, what is the greatest play of all time. And then a few weeks later, in fact, I'm gonna be doing this with them on Friday, so I hope they're not watching, but I will, um, <laughs> none of them are here. You better not be here, you little brats. Um, but uh, I'll say what is, <laughs> what is, what makes a great play great? Like think of the play that you said the first day and what, what, does, what elements does that contain? You know, and they, we make this list of all the things of what, may, you know, and everyone's like a little bit stumped because it's like, well, it just should be obvious. Isn't that obvious? And so we make the list. And then I say, what does a really, what makes a really bad play? Like what, what would, think of the worst play that you've ever experienced, either reading it or seeing it. And then we list those. And it's always way more fun of a list to make. And then we do a writing exercise where they have 10 minutes and they have to write a play using all, that has all, you know, the great elements. So, and they only have 10 minutes, so it's an impossible task. They're going to fail at it. So some of them really love it, but mostly this very heavy energy comes into the room because they're thinking about death of a salesman or Hamlet and how they'll never, how am I ever gonna measure up to that? And all the things that I said about the structure and how am I gonna do that in this playwriting class, but I feel like I have to. And like, <laughs> so then we do that and then I give them 10 minutes to write the worst play. And all of a sudden like everyone's little devil horns come up <laughs> at their desk and the energy of the room completely changes and people are like, they just can't like write it out fast enough and there's all this joy and craziness and a sense of defiance or rebellion or like whatever, like all of a sudden everyone's creative engine, whatever it is, is like revving up really fast and because they're being given total permission to go headlong into failure and it's, uh, it's always very moving to watch because suddenly everybody's juices are flowing, whereas before it was like, oh God, you know, it's so heavy and so depressing. And um, I can't now remember what the question was, but okay, well, yeah. That, uh, but I don't know, my, uh, that makes me think of something that I was gonna say, which is that, you know, 
those students at that moment are getting to enjoy the privilege of, of, of beginning uh, and, and doing something wrong. Yeah. And I think that that's where you know a lot of work, maybe like that we all make, uh, sometimes starts from a kind of contrarian impulse where I don't want to do it that way. I'm going to do it. You know, I'm going to break all the rules. I'm going to make something that doesn't look at all like it's supposed to. And that's and that is a wonderful privilege of just starting out of doing something. But what I thought of when you, in your previous question, though, it it does begin to make a difference if when you know when you first greet your audience and they don't know who you are and they've never seen your work then you get to do that you get to you know you get to show them the worst play that you can think of and they're thrilled with it you know and they and they can't believe you did that and it's it's all fun and exciting but then after a while you do that successfully a few times say and you have you know let's say one of the trappings of success is an audience that continues to come back and see your work and and tell you how much they like it um, then you're in a very different position where you have to fail not against some, uh, you know, other objective model of what's correct, but against yourself. And, you, and that's something that I think we found because, you know, for a while we, we had this idea that we would um, just not do what we were supposed to. And then after a while, the thing that we got used to being, we, we became familiar with a new set of rules, which was how we did things. And then we needed to not do that, and that's a lot harder. So by we, you mean ERS yeah. uh, as an ensemble? In case, yeah. Uh, and are you talking about a specific moment in the ensemble's evolution, maybe around GATS, for example, when you had a kind of breakout uh, well, it hit? Was, it was actually before that. Um, it was after about six years of making work, and we had actually tried to figure out what the right way to make an ERS show was. And that seemed to be, and you know, we'd had one show that we thought was better than all the other ones, and we got to just keep repeating that. And it was a deadly exercise. It was. It worked out terribly, and mostly because we just didn't feel good doing it. You know, there was no fun in that. And then we started to ask ourselves, just as an exercise, well, let's do the thing we would never do. And so that was a way of trying to orchestrate. I'll, you know, I'll try to keep this in the language of failure, but it was trying to orchestrate a sort of failure to do, you know, to be ERS and to fail to do an ERS show, uh, at least according to some sort of simplified model of it that we'd thought up. And that became really helpful. That, that was a big revelation. So. so that's really interesting. And I wonder what kinds of changes to your process you would make in order to um, open up new room. Well, we basically just decided Spin. we did not have a process. And that having a process, a thing that, you know, a series of steps was a bad idea for us. And we just needed to make sure we didn't ever do that. Even though we do it by accident all the time, you know, repeat ourselves. Now, Sybil, you just started your own company. Um, before that, you worked, you collaborated with a lot of artists, and um, starting your own company, did that differ? Uh, uh, was that a difference all of a sudden? Was there a shift in how you? Yeah, it really was the last thing that I felt like doing, to be honest, and now I'm really paying. Like I'm doing all the budgets and like <laughs> it's so horrible and I'm hardly writing at all. Um, but I, I did, uh, I just, there were some people in my life that I trusted, other artists who kept telling me over and over, you have to start your own company for years. And I was not listening because I did not feel like doing that. It was so much easier just to write, just lock myself up and write and write and write and write and write. And, um, and it, I had a, a great period where I was able to do so many different projects all over the place. Um, but I, I, I just started to listen to these people. I mean, I knew that I trusted them. And I, I, I guess I, the impulse to start writing came from being a frustrated performer. And, and so I started writing stuff for myself to perform in. And so I feel like as a playwright, it's not that I was becoming frustrated, but I felt like I needed to put my money where my mouth was or something because the writing was so crazy and then I didn't always know how to answer the questions that came up about it. And so I, it's almost like um, the general who sends their troops out into the war and then stays back at the camp and has a beer. And I felt like I wasn't really getting in there. And I, I was, 
I was like, in, <laughs> drinking a lot of beer. <laughs> I was drinking so much beer, <laughs> and it got lonely in the tent. <laughs> And the soldiers came back, and no one wanted to party with me because they'd been fighting all day. And so, so I decided I just would start, I, I would just see what happened. And I, I really just started mentioning it to people at first, like just talking about that I was going to do it. And I just felt this energy behind it, which was similar to the energy that I felt from people when I started um, uh performing my own writing. And so I sort of felt like, OK, this is the right track. It's not what I feel like doing, but it, it's, it's, it's the right path. And so, so now I'm in there. And I think my writing is changing a lot. And I, I feel like I have way less control over the actual writing now, because I'm doing all this other stuff that um, I feel the effects of what it has to serve or something. I don't know. It's, I, I'm not sure what's happening. but. <laughs> I'm doing it. I got a budget in the oven right now. I'm almost <laughs> done with it. <laughs> It'll deepen over time. Yeah. It will deepen over time. <laughs> so you mentioned writing, and that's interesting to me, um, because in science, for example, uh, where experimentation has a certain um, methodological rhythm uh, where each experiment is then evaluated systematically in order to determine how to move forward with the next steps, et cetera. Um, and there is an evaluation process that's extremely important, whether the experiment succeeds or fails is determined in the evaluation. Um, so what kind of evaluation process do you do for yourselves um, about the success or failure of a given project? Is it different, it must be different for solo artists or for writers or if you're a solo filmmaker, uh, then if you're an ensemble, then I imagine it's a more collaborative evaluation. But I'd be curious to hear how you determine uh, and evaluate your, your work for yourselves. Um, I have two answers. Um, I'll speak to, um, <clears throat> as uh, wearing my curator hat and organizing seasons and um, putting all of this energy into the work of other people. For me, it really is quite simple. At the end of a year, <clears throat> if I feel like it's really, it's really, and this, this sounds counterintuitive, maybe, but for me, it's really important that looking back at the at a season that's happened, that not that the work not all feel good. It's I mean, I, I feel like if I programmed a season that was really successful, then I would, that, that would just be a message to myself that I wasn't um, working hard enough to identify people, to identify artists who were really pushing on something. Because if the artists are really pushing on something, they're not all going to make pieces that feel, I mean, that's, that's, it's so subjective, I know, but that feel successful in some way. Um, and so it's really important to me that there be a really interesting balance between just different the, the, the response to the work in that way. In terms of my own stuff, my, the stuff that I'm making, um, this is something that you said in, the, in your very first answer at the beginning of this conversation. That you know, I think choosing to work in this, um, to do this kind of work in this country in this culture is such a ridiculous um, and impossible undertaking. That for me, it really just comes down to at the end of the day. It was <clears throat> that did all of the um, the effort and the money and the time that I invested into something did it feel worth it to me? And I don't mean did it pay off. Just <clears throat> sorry, do I did I feel like it was not a complete waste of my time? Um, because there because all, virtually almost anything else would be um, e less stressful to do. So for me, it, it, it <clears throat> for me to feel satisfied with have, with just even the the labor that of of doing it, it just has to somehow feel worth it. And that means a lot of different things. Um, but it, it mainly is a sort of just, do I feel, do I, uh, it's more, it's really kind of a gut response situation for me. Yeah, I guess I would, I relate to that, but I, it, it, this is a question you get asked when you are writing a grant sometimes. How will you evaluate the success <laughs> of this project? And that always strikes me as like, I, I don't feel like I'm really the right one to ask that question to. I mean, or uh, what I'm making is, you know, do I have to, 
it feels like the only real measure of the project's success is like something that happens inside the mind of someone watching it that I can't get at, that I don't, you know, I don't have any way of reading that. I mean, I could have people come up to me and say, oh, I had this great experience, or, or have people come up to me and say, I didn't get that at all, you know, and what's wrong with you guys? But, um, but that, you know, that, that's, you, that it's hard to measure that, you know, and I don't, and in a way, I mean, I, when I see that question on those forms, <coughs> sometimes I, I, I draw a complete blank. I really don't know. It actually feels like that kind of, like that, that the success of it is so out of my hands. I mean, I know, I know a feeling working on something, a certain kind of excitement that I get, a sort of drive that gets ignited to keep doing it and to keep per pursuing something. That, I guess, is, is the closest thing I can imagine to, to knowing success, in a way, is that I am st still feeling determined to do it. So how do you know what to do next? Is it purely impulsive? Well, that's the other. Uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe. I, I mean, the one thing that I do try to make sure of is that I don't do the same thing twice. Or that if, even if I am doing, you know, we did a novel, we're doing another novel, at least it has to feel like a completely different thing. You know, in the early days, one of those things I thought we'd get good at is, uh, you know, knowing from the beginning how it was going to go and not having to sort of sp face off with the void, you know. And but you do, you have to do it every single time. And and the sort of terror of f failure, the terror of not being able to think of anything, is a necessary starting point every time. So I don't know, and I and I guess I shouldn't. <laughs> I think that. Um I'm so glad that you brought up science because I think about science all the time and I love science and I also hate it so much. And, um, but I think the one thing that I hate about it the most is, the, um, is this patently false commitment to being objective and that that's even possible and that we must remain objective at all times and I feel like when from like 1850 to 1950 and now you know i feel like it kind of petered out somewhere really recently but when science came to rule the way we uh look at reality and that we have to keep our own feelings totally out of the picture and that's how we'll evaluate you know and i so I think about science so much because I feel like it has to really balance, art. one of the jobs of making artwork is to balance that um, kind of tyranny that happened during that 100 year span. And so I feel like it has to be subjective. And I answer that grant question in the same way. I listen to what people say. And I, you know, I have a feeling about it deep inside myself that's a feeling with a capital F. Um, <laughs> But I, I listen to what people say and how varied it is. And then, and that's how I evaluate it. And I really like when I hear from someone, I don't really understand what happened, but I had a good time, is, uh, is always to me a great response. Um, or I, I, I didn't really get it, it wasn't, wasn't my cup of tea, but, um, but I had some laughs or something like that, that where it's, you know that they're gonna take it and chew on it later. It's not just going to be like, I got it. That was great. Good night. And then they're, they're <laughs> on to the next thing. It's like, I, yeah, I don't know. Sorry. I just, I don't have, you know, very much else to offer. Then I'm like, okay, you know, or that was awful. <laughs> then, and, and, and when there's all different responses that, that always feels like, okay, that's a good, a positive evaluation. Yeah, well, it's interesting. So the response is, it's sort of similar, right? That you're sort of, you know, every project is different and, you know, responses are different. And I wanted to quickly come back also to Brian, what you were saying, like wearing your producer hat. It's, um, you're in a really wonderful position because of your work, like really building a wonderful audience that comes and trusts your taste and your curation and probably also a board, right, that is behind you and, you know, goes into fire for you on, um, that, that might be the same for you, John, and ERS, right? And Zubo, are you 
doing that board and no, all of that yet. stuff? At one, one of these days I'm going to. Yeah, so I, I think there is the support system, right? Take your that, time, that take you your time with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's the support system that, you know, you re rely on? Uh, well, I mean, it's all, I mean, you know, I run the chocolate factory with Sheila, um, my, with uh, my partner, Sheila. Um, we do have, there are there are structures of support that we've managed to that have managed to build up over the years, there, um, and we do have a, when we have a great board at the at the moment. It's so much work to develop those things, and it, and it's work that doesn't really stop, and it never feels. And this is not a complaint. It's like I feel quite blessed actually to be in the place where I am, but it's not a thing that ever, um, for me, has achieved any kind of so, any feeling of solid. It's never, it's not, none of it has ever felt like it's not just going to dis potentially disappear tomorrow. And that's just, I think, part of what it means to, to do it. Um, and I'm always having, we're always having to think about who, who else we might bring onto our board and how we're going to, you know, in this kind of chess game kind of way, like make them like us over the next 18 months and like and, and help them to understand what it is that we do and then all of those things really do go into it. And I think, um, but I am really lucky and I think, you know, we do have, um, again, the scale of my place is quite small so I don't, I don't want to make it seem as if I'm some kind of great impresario but we do, have an, we do have a really beautiful audience. I don't know that they'd come because they trust me or my taste. They're just, they're just, we're just very tied to um, a community of artists and other kinds of people in New York that are just sent that have just kind of coalesced around the, this this kind of work. Um, I, I mean, I do I think I do think that my work as a curator um, makes a, it, it does contribute to something, but I don't think that I definitely don't think I sit in this position where like people are coming to see all these shows because I chose them. It's not really the but but to your point, yeah. I mean, I feel very lucky that I have those things, and I don't. And on the scale that we're working, I don't really have to worry. I don't worry. I mean, I probably maybe I should worry. I don't really worry about what um, members of my board or the audience are going to think about the work that's happening. I mean, I, I think the main reason that I do what I do, I think the strongest impulse always from the time I was, you know, a kid was that I wanted to be inside. A, a sort of uh, social situation. I wanted to be among people that I liked and trusted and and could play with, you know, and so and and where a kind of chaos could be going on and everybody was happy about it, and so I think that's that's been my impulse from the beginning is to sort of, I mean, I can't. I've been asked to direct things outside of my company a, a few times, and I can't and I don't know where to begin I, to, to imagine myself in a vacuum. Uh, and then starting to put something together around me. I can't think creatively unless I'm inside that group of people. So, it, it, and that, you know, and as we've gotten bigger, you know, 25 years ago, that was like five other people in somebody's apartment, you know. And now we have an office and we have a staff and we have a pretty big board, but I, I, we try to build all of that the same way. We don't think of just the actors as being an ensemble, the people who work people who only work in the office, or some people work in the office sometimes and go on tour, you know, it's, a, it's all one thing, or at least we try to make it that way, and so that, that kind of, it's in a way like those people are not just, they're not support, they, they are what I'm doing, they're, they're the place where I'm doing it. So. so this is interesting in terms of the values that you have as makers, um, but I'm interested maybe to not think about the audience um, and to go back into the studio and the rehearsal situation a little bit, the creation situation, um, to get at exactly what John just said about that sense of play and um, holding on to it, maintaining it. Um, what kinds of things do you do in the creative act, in rehearsal, in the studio, to cultivate that chaos that you say you love? I mean, it's, if you watch ERS in rehearsal, one of the things that you just enjoy so much is the kind of freewheeling 
<laughs> myths of the ensemble uh, everywhere they go, basically. Uh, and it's great. Trail um, of destruction. Yeah. But on the other hand, uh, the process of rehearsal is so often about smoothing things out or making them cohere or something like that. How do you, how do you guard against that? How do you maintain that sense of play, that cultivated chaos? How do you bring imperfection into the process? Can you talk about some imperfections that happened that you maybe decided to go with or incorporate or build into a project? Gosh, I think most of what we, I don't know, I'm, I, I'm, just, I'm thinking about when Sybil and I were working together on her play um, and you know, the way, I think it, I think part of it, I'm, for some reason, I'm thinking about Susie crawling across yeah, the floor. Yeah, I'm sitting here like, Susie Soko. <laughs> <laughs> Susie crawling across the floor, which, you know, we were working on that one scene, and it, had, it seemed to be getting a little bit serious, maybe, or something. But there's a kind of, I think everyone's familiarity gives everybody permission to, to you know, um, be mischievous. Mm -hmm. And in this case, you know, Susie just... I think in order to kind of mock the seriousness of the scene, did some sort of interpretive dance crawl across the floor, and that became a character. This is Sybil's play, Fondly Colette Richland, in New York Theatre oh. Workshop last year. Yes. Um, and can you maybe tell us more about that scene and what, <laughs> what was well, supposed like to happen um, and what did happen? Yeah. It's like a household scene, and it's very, you know, everybody's, Lorena's here, she could probably do some of it for us. <laughs> um, but, and they're really talking um, in enormous detail, and everything is really, like, so um, pulled together, almost like the whole scene is in a corset or something. And then... Mike's music on top of yeah, it. Yeah, and there's music, and everything's happening very painfully, slowly. And Susie was just sort of getting into the music and just started do, you know, sort of molesting Mike a little bit over here. And, and everyone has known each other for tens of thousands of years. So everyone knows how take. to, you know, there's all, you know, give or take. So everyone knows how to sort of turn the knife into one another in performance. And so it was really fun to write for that group having performed with them also because I also know where all their buttons are. And, how to do this, and I could make them say stuff, and um, <laughs> and give them stuff that I knew they would love to say. Um, so that was really fun. But I think I always thought about John and Susie that Susie always brings like the chaos, like the the um, like the Dionysian chaos to John's Apollonian sense of order and balance, <laughs> and. Um, it, it, and it's generative and, and, that, and sort of knocking, knocking things off kilter all of the time, no matter what. And, um, and, and, and it's, a, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful working relationship to watch and be a part of. And I think on some level, we all do that with ourselves. There's a certain amount of order and there's a certain amount of chaos. And everyone has, and I find that every project has a place where okay now it's time I got to get this I got to pull this together and you know meet meeting it up somehow and and then there's times where you can't do that anymore I have to just let something happen that is um, out, out of out of my control and um, it, and it depends on on what kind of work you're talking about that that um, what am I a oh, ratio it's like a, a, that that ratio and the and the time where you're going to bring order into the equation or some people start out with a very orderly situation and then let it unravel from there and then bring it back um, into order at, at some other point but I think that um, that seems to be uh, something that is really important and, and that you have to figure out a new for each piece I yeah. feel like it's but it's not irreverence I mean I think it's a willing to, willingness to be completely irreverent with whatever we have in the room even if the writer's in the room with us <laughs> but it, it, in that and in that respect, that's a kind of unspoken acknowledgement that we all have, just to bring it back around, to the fact that, it's, that what we want is a kind of messy failure, that what we want is something that isn't, you know, some piece of perfection that, you know, that very clearly communicates exactly one point. You know, I don't think we trust that. And also, you know, we, um, it's, it's just where we're comfortable. You know, and so we, we've learned that, you know, not taking ourselves too seriously is probably the best way to get out of our own heads 
and so there's a kind of work that we believe in, which is always kind of falling apart and is a big mess, and that then I get the job of trying to put it back together. Um, but that's fun, you know? <laughs> I was going to say, poor John. <laughs> no, I asked for it. <laughs> Maybe stepping back for a second and thinking about the ecology of New York performance, how, how, many, how many places are there for that kind of experience of, a kind of chaotic performance where you don't know where it's going or that's going to be or out of control. Or I'm just thinking. I'm always thinking back to the '80s when I started seeing performance work. I was going to say a, not as many as, as I a used teenager, to be. actually, uh, and um, seeing so many, so many wild uh, performances that really did fail often, but also were very exciting um, in the way that they were breaking through into new artistic aesthetic territory. Now it seems, um, partly because of the changes that are taking place in our city, uh, that there are fewer um, spaces for that kind of, um, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of wild experiment. Uh -huh. um, can you talk about that as artists? What does that mean to you? Do you feel like you are hemmed in uh, in some way? Uh, how, do you, how, how do you find a place within this urban economy, shall we say, uh, to, um, to allow yourself that space I mean, to play. I mean, for me, I'm sorry to no. jump in. For me, um, you know, when I came to New York in the 90s, I mean, this is, I mean, I, I think New York always like begins for everyone at the moment that they arrive here. And, but, it, um, for, you know, when I, when I, when I, um, when I came to New York in the mid 90s, I was, um, actually, I think the first time I ever saw an ERS show may have been, you know, when there were all these places on Ludlow Street, there was a little, little kind of theater district and there were all these venues, and I felt like the, the venues, wh wh what the venues were and where they were and who was sort of running them, that, would, that was constantly shifting. There was this kind of sense that spaces might be short-lived, but there'd always be some new one popping up. And that, and that went on for a while, and then it kind of stopped. Like, it sort of went away very quickly. Um, and I think that that's, I, I don't, um, if that's happening in New York now, I don't see it. So I mean, it's possible that there's this, like, new underground that I'm just not aware of, but I think the conditions have, are such now that it's not so easy. It's, it, I think like it might not be really be possible to find <clears throat> to find a storefront somewhere and then negotiate a rent that you can actually pay and then ha have it long enough to even make anything happen. But that kind of real, really low to the ground ecosystem was super, super important to me as a, as a kid coming here and being able to, to see all of this stuff that was clearly being done by artists without resources and it was being sometimes being put together very quickly and then it, and it, there was something very ramshackle about all of it, but the energy that came, the energy that that, um, the immediacy that that provided was really, really um, incredible to me. And I think that, that it's, um, I think one of the things I wanted to try to preserve when I started my own place was some version of that, but it's never, it can never be, once you start to, um, any degree of institutionalization kind of works, um, works against that kind of um, freewheelingness to me. And, and I think that's, I think it's probably to the detriment of sort of the young, younger, you know, the new turnip truck comes in, they all, they all fall off of it, and where do those kids go to, to make things, I don't know where those kids are going to make things. Um, and I don't think that the opportunity, there's, yeah, there's a sort of not this kind of low to the ground series of opportunities that, that, it, that are sort of accessible to almost anyone who just wants to put the effort in. It's kind of like everything, a certain kind of thing gets noticed more maybe than it did 25 or 30 years ago where there was a kind of freedom to, you know, operate in those storefront theaters. And I'm sure everybody had some kind of dream of success or being able to, you know, pay their rent with, with, the, with their art. But, the, and I, maybe I'm just romanticizing this because this is the way I saw it when I was 20, you know, was that ah, everything was so gritty and nobody gave a shit, you know, and it was, you know, and you could just, you know, people were making big mess on stage and the, the nobody, uh, you know, nobody had an equity card and this kind of thing. And so, but that, <laughs> maybe that was, I mean, I always wonder if I'm just kind of, you know, if I'm seeing it through this window that has, you know, what I first saw here and what I'm now seeing here, but then, you know, I, I suppose, uh, hopefully, there, there are younger people out there now who are, to whatever extent they know about what I do, they're going like, I don't want to do that. I want to do something completely different. I don't want to, you know, I'm going to risk, I want to I want to take a risk of doing something that nobody's tried before. And I have to believe that still happens on some level, but I don't know. 
I mean, you have your, your kids. Yeah, I, I watch what happens with them. It's, it, it, it's disheartening because, you know, <laughs> New York used to be a really great place to come if you wanted to be an artist because it was so cheap to live here, which is hard to imagine now. And so everybody came. And it was so an undesirable city at some point. Yeah, yeah. It was bankrupt in the 70s. And yeah, and the whole nobody wanted to live in the East Village and nobody wanted to live on the Lower East. It was like the last place you wanted to go. And um, so it's, it's harder to come here and live an artist's life unless you have support from your parents from home. And I see them all struggling when they, when they come here. It's, it's, it's hard to watch. But then there are some of them who, I mean, a lot of them just end up going to grad school. And then I'm not sure what happens. Or some of the, a lot of them they teach are in grad school. And then they're like, they don't know what to do after. Maybe go back to grad school. Um, and so, but there's some of them who were doing stuff like in their bedrooms. Like they would invite people at like the, this, this, this one woman I had as a student just would invite people into her bedroom and they would sit on the bed and she would stand in the space next to the bed and do these beautiful little performances. And so I guess there's always, there's always some place and I often have wondered if public performance won't uh, make a comeback in, in some way, but it really seems like there's not even that much public space anymore where you might be able to get away with doing a performance um, without, um, you know, somebody calling the cops. I mean, it's it's like, e even the performance of self in this city has, I, I feel, I've see it, seen it become so much more constrained and homogenized um, during the time that I have lived here. There used to be, you know, even just to live here was a, was a performance and you had a complete creative agency and you could go as far as you wanted to go. And I see that so rarely now and when I do, I'm like, oh, oh my God, this is on roller skates and <laughs> glitter. Oh my God, I remember, you know, and I remember and I remember and it's so, it's devastating in a lot of ways and I don't feel that I've even lived here all, all that long. Um, but it's the changes have been swift, and I don't know what I don't know I, I don't know where it will end. I don't know what will happen. Well, I think it might be time to open up to the audience. <laughs> if there are any questions from you? Before we go down the, that road of <laughs> lament and oh, remember Nada, you guys. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> Anybody wants to ask a question? <laughs> oh, hold on, we are recording. So we will have a mic, yeah. I really don't know why we have these terms, success and failure, because the parameters have changed so much in every field, and success and failures are not diametric opposites, um, and, uh, I just uh, very uncomfortable because I've never understood what failure is. We learn so much from failure, and um, you know everybody is so attuned to uh, monetary success, so they measure everything in terms of profit. But if it nourishes your soul in whatever capacity, then it's got to be, uh, you know, rewarding and worthwhile. Agreed. I guess there's always some tension there, you know. I mean, there's always going to be some sense of what is success and if it's whether it's fame or money or whatever it is. We won't be able to banish that completely, but maybe pushing back against it as hard as we can is is healthy. It's interesting what Sybil says about the professionalization of the arts also, everybody going to graduate school and getting an MFA, uh, everybody incorporating their ensemble into a 501c3 and uh, a little kind of corporate unit and um, one wonders uh, what the relationship is between that and the uh, experimental possibilities for the form. Uh, hi. You're talking about like yourself as artists and then also as curators, and I'm just wondering how the idea of failure affects you personally, you, you know, like as human beings, which you are as artists, and 
and curators, but that sense of uh, value and how to get challenged at a um, personal level with those kind of things. I mean, I feel like I am a failure in every other way in my life that there's nothing else. There's <laughs> And, and, and I'm saying it jokingly, but I'm totally serious. I've been, it's something I've been thinking about lately. I don't have anything else in my life. I have a dog who's great, but um, that's it. And so it saved me. And I think like I came from a place of failure. Um, my whole family situation was of failure. From I'm, I was born into a failing marriage. And ev it was just like <laughs> constant, and yeah. and um, and it's fine, you know. I found something to do, but I feel very, very lucky uh, that I did find an artistic practice because it really did save me. Um, I really don't know what would have happened to me otherwise. So yeah. I mean, I think for me that's just about being able to contend with the unknown. Constantly, um, because I think when you, when you sort of set yourself on a course like this, um, where where whatever success you can identify is the result of something unexpected or is the result of taking a risk or or thinking you are going to fail somehow, really you, it's a constant struggle to just accept a lot of unknown. You know, I don't. I don't know what my company will be doing in three or four years. I don't, and I, and, I, and I don't feel like it's the right thing to do to make a plan either, because when it does work, when it, is, when it does give me some feeling of success, it's, it's because I stumbled on it, because I found it, not because I thought it up and planned it out. And there are other kinds of lives where that works, and that's what you should do. So it just is about constantly you know, working to develop a, a, a good relationship with this dark unknown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, told that, I, I relate to that so much. I mean, I feel like I have gotten really accustomed to just um, going through my life with this kind of low hum of anxiety <laughs> that's just sort of, lit, it's just sort of there, and, it, and it's always been there, and I think it will always be there, and I've just gotten more comfortable with um, or more used to the the notion that every that everything and um, everything in, in my life is just like a, on a, on a, a razor wire from. But then you know, and this is kind of very Bucketian or something. But like I feel like one of the things that I sort of repeat to myself as a mantra is that well, I've um, I survived doing this yesterday, so maybe tomorrow I'll survive doing this again, kind of kind of thing. But it, but definitely, I mean, but you know, it's like when I look at where I've. Um, you know, I'm in my 40s. I'm. <laughs> um, I don't have any. You know, it's not like I have a retirement fund. You know, I'm. Um, I started a venue with a woman that I was married to, and now I'm not married to her anymore. And that's all. The, and there's all of these things that have just kind of gone. Through, that. I, but it's like. Um, but neither would I change it. I don't know that I had an. I sort of don't know that I had any choice in the matter. Yeah, that's how I feel too. <laughs> David, yeah. Um, we've, as you've been talking, uh, there seems to be a pretty generous orientation toward the audience. Oh, maybe they'll like it, maybe they won't. I'm curious if you, if you see as artists that the audiences do have a task. Could we apply a metric of success or failure to audiences? Uh, can an audience fail to participate in a certain way? Or on the flip side, could the audience fail in a productive way? Well, I don't know. I mean, I always... Uh, I think about how I want how I want to feel as an audience member, and I don't want to have any responsibility when I'm sitting in the audience. I do not want to be dragged up on stage. I don't want the house lights to come on. I want to be totally anonymous. So, I think when I think about the audience, I'm thinking about lots of me's out there who who you know who I don't who don't who are just there to receive, and uh, and maybe that I'm sure a lot of people disagree with this, and I, and I think a lot of people probably have very different ideas about what an audience is, but. My very personal feeling about it is that it's all on me as the artist, and I may, you know, and I may succeed with them in some ways that I wasn't expecting, and it may not be all about what I intended, but I, 
you know, I feel like I have to, that's just part of what I bought into. I have to accept as my responsibility whatever doesn't work for them. And it doesn't mean I'm gonna have to fix that. It doesn't mean that, you know, I absolutely owe a great personal experience to every single person, but, but I feel like it's on me as the, as the artist. Yeah, I sort of feel like if an audience member comes, makes it to the place, gets the butt in the seat, success for the audience. <laughs> because theater is an event that unfolds in a shared moment of time, in a shared space. And if you make it there and you spend the time, and you can leave halfway through, it's fine. But you have to be there. The only failure is not showing up. Hi. Uh, I think I have a question about something that you guys were talking about, about New York City being sort of impossible um, and America being a terrible place to be an artist. Um, being one myself, um, I get a little bit emotional when that is the response um, because I'm doing it. And uh, I think there's an importance and a value in the impossibility of it that has always been there. Um, and I hear it a lot, so I'm, I guess my question is, uh, do you see, like what is the, for you, what remains the same back then and now? Um, can you pinpoint some things that feel that way? Sources of resilience, among other yeah. things, yeah. yeah. I feel it's really important to be comfortable with a sense of uncertainty and to try to um, see things more as a mystery instead, because that makes it a little more engaging. <laughs> um, and really, I feel that the human relationships are something that do not change and that I mean, John said it, and I feel the same. You know, my first community theater project at age 12 was like, oh, I love all these people. Everybody's so much fun. I love all these jokes everyone's making, or, you know, I just loved all of these people being together. And that, to me, is what doesn't change. And it, it alters, and, and, you know, you have different configurations. But for me, that's what keeps me um, buoyant within it. I mean, I think that we haven't said this explicitly, but maybe implicitly there's a criticism of the, you know, culture, or uh, we live in a country where there's not a lot of, um, you know, government support of the arts compared to other places. Um, and, uh, and, but when I think about that, and, I, and, and, and it's connected to just the difficulty of doing theater in New York City, which crazily is maybe one of the hardest places in the world to do this because this is a medium that depends on real estate. <laughs> and you know, we could probably only do worse by trying to all go to San Francisco. But it, it's, it's the hardest place to do what we're doing, but that's, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that's what actually gives it all this life. And, and I'm not just romanticizing the struggle of it, but, but some of that impossibility and some of the just ridiculousness of you know, doing it here is actually what gives it all this life. And I don't think I would want to be, now I mean I've been lucky, I've been very lucky because I'm able to support myself doing what I do and that's, and you know, almost anybody who comes here to do it has to get, go through some time of not being able to do that and maybe for a long time and that's not to be taken lightly. You know, there is great injustice in that but I don't think I'd, having said that, I don't think I'd want to be in a place where the government gives my company a gigantic grant every year and we can make a show or not, everybody's going to get paid. I mean, I remember hearing about what happened in, in Ireland, when uh, in, in Dublin, when the, the Arts Council there suddenly cut everybody's funding because of the financial crisis and, and nobody knew what to do. And I would never want to be in a position like that. You know, we're always having to scrap around and, and dig a little, $1,000 here, $1,000 here, $100 here to make what we do. And, and I think that keeps us alive. I think there's something really, um, I mean, I don't know. I, I, tr 
I travel to Europe quite a lot. I mean, not as much as Tom does, but I, I travel to Europe a lot to see, to see work. And I know, and I have, I have relationships a lot with a lot of artists and, and colleagues in Europe. And there is still something, I think, um, about the energy of, uh, of New York in particular that um, everyone is drawn to, even uh, <clears throat> despite the, 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 really stra the, the really stark imbalances in support that happen. I mean, everyone still, in one way or the other, wants to be seen here. And there's a, and there's a, and there's a reason for that. Um, I think that this is still the place um, where the weird people can find the other weird people. And this is the place where, the, uh, the, uh, um, and this is maybe the, one of the things that I think, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, changes, the changes in New York, I think, um, have made this much more, they may have accelerated this, but I think New York has always been a place where, um, I think New York teaches you whether you're meant to do this by how, how, uh, how much you have to do it. I think there's always been a kind of winnowing. I mean, Sybil and I came to New York at basically the same time, and you know how many people came, were to, how many people did we know in the '90s that were that were identifying as artists who were not doing that? I mean, I don't know. There's lots and lots of them, and it's winnowed and winnowed and winnowed over time. And maybe that happens more quickly now. But the people um, who are determined to do it because they can't do anything else are still going to do it, and so there's a, and they'll figure out a way to do it, and that's. I think more, to, to John's point, more possible here than any place else. I mean, I also spent a lot of time, all of these sort of second cities, I just haven't, I haven't yet been to another city in the United States where there's a kind of homegrown scene that has achieved, that has coalesced in, just in, 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 in the same way that it has here. I feel like I gotta add something though, and that, I, and I don't wanna take for granted that, you know, and I can only speak for myself, but you know, I come from, privilege to some extent, you know, that what Sybil was saying before, like we, y you have to have some help to be able to do this. And I, and I don't ever want to take for granted that, you know, even though I was, you know, temping and, and doing, uh, you know, some theater tech work to make, to get by and not making a lot of money and getting in a lot of debt, I still had help. And, and I, and I think that maybe that is Maybe that's objectively becoming a problem with how expensive the city is getting. That it does, it does sort of subtly. Some of the people that are getting weeded out, we should acknowledge. It's not just because they couldn't hack it. It's because they didn't have, you know, uh, you know, parents in some other state who were willing to, you know, if not bail them out, always make them feel like they were never going to fall through the floor if they couldn't get a job doing what they loved. So, I mean, that, that's, that's something we, I feel like we shouldn't glaze over that. Yeah, thanks, thanks for acknowledging that. Maybe one last question. Um, this sort of relates to something you alluded to earlier, the funneling of people, uh, the encouragement of funneling people into the MFA program so early in their Lives such that I was looking over this book that's called something like How I Made It or How I Got Into Playwriting. It came out maybe a couple years ago. Um, and uh, it talked about how the guy kept asking each of these playwrights that had they heard this thing, if they hadn't made it as a playwright by 30, forget about it. Has this affected experimental experimenting, just the fact of people taking going to school for stuff and not having real life experiences doing, I don't know, just other things, and then possibly being encouraged to follow a particular track or pander to people with a particular kind of experimenting. Thanks. I just ha we have to wonder like what, because there's the playwright, there's the model of the playwright who writes a play and then sends it out and somebody comes and like a theater is like, we love this play, we're gonna produce it. And then they produce it. And, <laughs> and then, you know, there's that model, which I would not be sitting here if I had tried to follow that model. I always just did it myself. And I was, um, if not over 30, like close. So, 
I, I, I don't, I mean, is it, yeah, I, I don't know. I think that you can write a play no matter what age and that, um, like, making it, I don't know what, the, I'm not sure what that means. I don't know where that. I wasn't, I thought it was the stimulus that came back. Yeah. Like, it's more about the, it's almost like trash to be able to be getting agents. Or maybe you can speak to this. You know, and then all the theaters, I was just looking at Abington no longer takes so, uh, unsolicited submissions and the vineyard stopped doing it this year and it's it, and suddenly there's only like two places in all of New York City that will look at a poll thing. You know, and I, I know that people's departments have been cut, you know, and you just can't keep, you know, it's just this tremendous like, tsunami of stuff that would come in otherwise, but it just seems like just not the greatest situation. I don't know. I think it's very hard to write plays and just send them out into the world and hope for the best. It just seems kind of phew, tough. That's a very tough, tough way to go. Uh, I think this is probably an inspiring uh, and productive place to end, which I didn't actually think we were going to get to, but hearing uh, your examples of what sustains you and nourishes you has been really, uh, really helpful. Um, thank you all for your candor today. I know this is not an easy subject to talk about in some ways. Um, and thank you for sharing your perspectives and your career trajectories with us uh, for this conversation. There is a six o'clock event uh, called Pieces We Never Did in which uh, participants in this year's Prelude Festival uh, will be sharing uh, uh, also along a uh, kind of personal lines about projects that they aspired to make but for one reason or another did not or which they were attached to uh, but which never came to fruition for one reason or another. So um, we'll take a short break and then return for that six o'clock event and also stick around for seven o'clock and eight o'clock uh, when our special guest uh, Matthew Goulish uh, will be talking about the Institute of Failure and uh, will also be offering us an original Made for Prelude performance uh, at eight o'clock called Broken Red Balloon Dog New York Edition uh, with a, a fabulous group of uh, contributing artists and writers. So a lot going on uh, today. We'll continue this conversation in the lobby and also this evening at uh, 9.30, 10 o'clock, um, the opening night party of Prelude will be at the Archive Bar on 36th Street, really just up and around the corner. So this is a conversation that could easily <laughs> spill over into that opening <laughs> night party as we all uh, uh, share our uh, sorrows and failures together um, and also uh, revel in the success of the opening day of Prelude. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you all. Thank you.